I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I'm not an operating theater. I'm not. I'm not a fireman running into a building. When I'm not a hero. Yeah, I'm an athlete and I'm an extremely good one. I'm one of the best ever. I'm, if I'm the world champion and I want to be world champion and be proud to be world champion, I will beat whoever's put in front of me. So that's what I went out and did. How I, I'm a complete contradiction in what I do. Yeah, my hands are low, but sometimes my hands are up. I am an attacking counterpuncher, which is a complete contradictory. But at that time, I wasn't aggressive enough yeah. to punish him for the mistakes he was making. Um, that fight taught me what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. And then I went forward and knocked the next 15 people out. Mm -hmm. It's understanding that science, which fighters have got wrong. The dropping weight, they've done that slightly wrong, but the rehydration part, they've got that wrong. And when he got in the ring for two, two and a half rounds, he actually smashed this kid. And then he just went, boom. I knew they'd had the big drum roll with him and they were pushing him and I just went, I'll box him, I'll beat him. And, he'd, and Frank just looked at me and went, yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. Fight never happened. You walked in that gym, if you didn't bump into someone who was at least a British champion, yeah. you were very unlucky. You are in the wrong gym. <laughs> you, were, you were extremely unlucky. I don't particularly hate the man, mm. yeah. but what he's done is horrible and distasteful, mm -hmm. and it's it's wrong. Bradford is known as a tough city. Did you have any kind of gangsters and bad boys trying to latch onto you to, to do their dirty work? At the end of the day, you do your job, I do my job. My job gets more recognition than yours, but I'm brilliant at what I do. But at the same time, it's just a job. So today we're doing the life story of Junior Witter. We've got the three J's in the room, Junior, Jamie Boyle and Jen. And Junior was the nemesis of the boxer, Ricky Hatton, but he did not dare risk Stepping up to the plate, did he, Jamie? Yeah. <clears throat> do you know? Do you know? It's an interesting story. Uh, ten, ten years that fight was spoken of. The British public demanded it, and it just never. You know, <clears throat> when they when they were both coming through, Ricky was a WBU champion. Junior was a British Commonwealth European. Ricky was saying, you know, he hasn't brought nothing to the table. And then when they were both world champions, Ricky was IBF. And um, WBA, and then, WBA. <clears throat> no, it wasn't. It was yeah. IBF against Costa Zoo, and then yeah, well. WBA against Mauser. So in this time, Junior had um, won the WBC, which was vacant from Floyd Money Floyd Money Mayweather. Yes, Floyd. Uh, so you know, I didn't know what he had to do to get the fight, and um, us British paying public never got to see it. But it's a crying shame. It really, really is. So I'm from Widnes then. I know it was like growing up in the north. I ended up yeah. in America though. And you, you said you're from Bradford. Yeah. So what, what was that like for you growing up in Bradford? Um, it's funny because it was, obviously it's very multicultural. Um, and it changed, it, obviously it changed over the years, but like when I was younger, um, I was in a predominantly Asian area. Um, the black, community within Bradford was extremely spread out really well that was really intermingled um but yeah we there was some um there was some times when you stood there you thought yeah it's getting it's getting touchy tonight yeah yeah I mean <clears throat> obviously I'm going to be doing Nick Manor's book at the minute and a lot of the things that he's told me because obviously Nick's from West Yorkshire you're from South Yorkshire so Nick's grown up is this you know young black kid? Yes, Bradford is multicultural, a lot of a huge Asian pop population. But did you suffer a lot of things yourself, like racism from like? Um, yeah. Um, well, I grew up in Bradford, which is West Yorkshire, next to Leeds. Um, and like Nick's just that little, he's that little bit older than me, and I just felt they got it that little bit harder than I did. Like my parents got it really hard when they came over. Because that was a generation before, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, like my parents, 
mum came over early late sixties. Um, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. No Irish. They went through all that torture. Um, but my dad got got through, found the job, worked in steelworks, whatever, um, buildings, did all sorts. But then days you walked out of job in an afternoon, you walked into the next one next morning. And it did that a few times, just through the race, and they, they, he suffered. Was it a happy, happy childhood in Bradford then? Um, pretty much what for me. Um, because like my mum and dad are under nightclub at times, social club. So we were not rich, but we were, mm. were decent off. We want, we want on the poor side. So by the time I came through, um, because my brothers were a couple years older than me, about five years older than me, I, I had my own stuff. Mm. Um, I won't hand me downs anymore, like my brothers were. Um, I had my own stuff, and therefore, I had a bit more than most of the kids in my area. Mm. Um, but we got on, we mingled, we did, did whatever. Um, yeah, there was, there was bits where I looked at it and I thought, I remember one time we were walking through park, and with me and my mate Pete, and we, Peter, we we're walking down. We've been through park. We we're walking down because we went to church because we were big church goers. So we were coming back from church, and these three lads started to pick on us. And I'd say they were probably one of them were probably f- four or five years older than me. And they just saw us two, and they thought, right, they're having it. Yeah. Um, and we managed to get away. But I they chased. Yeah, well, we ran off. Um, <laughs> I think the chases for about a mile. Hmm. So, what what was the point in your life, young junior, where you thought, do you know what, I'm going to walk into a boxing gym and I'm going to learn to fight? Um, what it was with me, I had a friend at school and he boxed. Um, I think I'm, I'm 10, 11, and he boxed and he talks about it and I just went, one minute, you get in fights, hmm. you beat people up <laughs> and you don't get in trouble. And I just went, I want some of that. Mm. <laughs> how, 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 old, how old was this me then? I was about 11. Yeah, I was 11. Because um, I'd been in trouble in school. I had loads of fights. Mm. There were a kid who were in my year, and he thought with a big, big bad bully of his school cock at the year, he's going to give it to everyone. And he came up to me to give it to me, and I just slapped him down. Mm. And it didn't work out very well. Well, the fight didn't work out well for him. Mm. But within the school year, because he was in the area where most of the kids were from, they all were on his side. So it was me versus the school. So apart from obviously fighting in school, were there any other subjects that gripped you? Um, the sport, obviously. Um, <laughs> football. I, yeah, I love my football. Played cricket. Did all normal stuff in PE and stuff. Um, at that stage, I liked my maths, which was weird. <laughs> hated English. <laughs> Absolutely hated English. Um, sciences, I were all right. I like my science as well. So I like my science. Um, I like my maths. But they were the only subjects that I really liked. Other stuff I'd sometimes pay attention to. <laughs> but most of the time, not. But um, like craft, woodwork, and that. Oh, I hate it. I love woodwork. I hate it. <laughs> we used to have a teacher called Mr. Wood. And he was, he was a big bloke. He was probably six foot. Um, but he wasn't like skinny with it, he was stout with it. And he was an absolute bully. What did he teach? Woodwork. 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 <laughs> Ironic. Mr. Wood taught woodwork. <laughs> <laughs> but, so when you've sorry, gone. No. So with him, um he was a bully. Um I remember one at times he grabbed one at lads for doing something at minor wrong. And he picked him up and he shook him like a rag doll and he slammed him down on the seat. And I'm stood there looking at teaching. I'm just stood there thinking, if he did that to me, he's getting that hammer in his head. <laughs> I'm telling you. But he got reported for it. Mm. But they didn't do anything. Um, I think he got a slap on the wrist. And I just thought, I don't get it. Because there's, there's punishment and there's going too far. And that was way too far. Um, but yeah, he didn't like me, he didn't like me either. Um, but he never actually grabbed me. He never grabbed me, never held me. It hit. I've seen him hit another lass on a, with a little piece of two before, smack her on top of her head for not doing something wrong. Is this yeah. back, is this back yeah. when there was canings and yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Back when there was actually, canings? Yeah. 
Really? Do, yeah. Don't you know about canings, Jim? Yeah, it was, yeah, ru- it was, it was ruled that out old. in 87. I don't look that old, I agree. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, I was, but that, even when that finished, even when Kane has just been banned, because I remember when that happened, it done, I'd seen him do it then. Mm. Um, Have you ever been Kane's? No, the, I've been threatened a few times. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> away from away from the school, you went into boxing. Were you a natural? Bradford yeah. Police Boxing Gym. Uh, yeah, I was a natural. Because um, what happened to me, how it started was, so when my friend told me about it, and I went, okay, and he went, I went, where do you go? And he went, oh, this gym in town is too far for you to go. You can't go, you can't go. And I just thought, well, town's a bit far for me anyway. And he went, oh, we've got Bradford Championships starting up. They've started you can go along to them up at Roadsway School. And I thought, okay. I went, when is it? It went Friday, six o'clock or whatever it was. Went along and I trained every Friday for four weeks. There were six, it was a six weeks course. So I did four because I, when I started late. Did the four weeks, then boxed at Bradford Championships. So I'd done four sessions over four weeks. Mm. Boxed in first round, stopped a kid. Boxed in second round, Got beat by a kid who'd been boxing four years at a time, called Jason Joseph. Mm. Um, and I know Jason, I've boxed him, boxed him loads of times actually mm. after that. But that's how I got into it. Did that, then, because that finished, there was no boxing there at the Roadway School anymore. So I had probably six months out, then found Bradford Police Boys Gym, which was about half a mile from my, where I lived at the time. Mm. Um, walked into there, and that was history. That was it. So, am I right in saying you represented England? You won national titles. Yeah, um, I captained England schools, so I boxed for England schools and captain. I think I boxed for England three times, but I captained their school amateur team. Uh, won a junior Bay title. Boxed for England at sixteen as a young England athlete, where I'm only the second person in history to do it. And the last, because after I did that, they said, no, we don't want anybody else that young. Mm. The band, they said, you've got to be old, you've got to be 17, you've got to be the actual official senior to actually box for England now. We don't like it. Um, that's a story as well. Yeah, uh, I'll get to that. So, do you, know, do you know what? Obviously, you were an accomplished amateur. You went on. Everyone really knows what you did, Junior, as a, as a professional. But I know a few stories on a few fighters who were very well known but they weren't back then, people like Ryan Rhodes. Yeah. So how many how many people from your amateur days can you say, right, a box team, box team, that people will go, wow, never knew that? Um, Ryan Rhodes, mm. Dean Francis. Um, Sadly passed now. Yeah. There's loads who've become and done something. But I run about it on the way down here with um, Aaron, partner, uh, business partner, about the weights. Because I boxed Dean Francis at the for the junior ABA title at welterweight, ten stone seven. He was a super welterweight. Went up to like heavyweight, mm-hmm. um, and most of the people I boxed when I ran back because I boxed at ten stones and amateur, ten seven is when I was like sixteen, and as a pro, I boxed at ten stone mm-hmm. at thirty two when I won world title. So sixteen years later, mm-hmm. I'm half stone lighter. And everybody I box is at least 12 or 12 and a half stone. And some are cruiserweights. So I'm like, I actually held my weight pretty well coming through. Mm. Different now, I've retired. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, what, what made you think, you know what, I've done this amateur boxing, I've won titles, I've boxed for England. Where where did the thought come to think, do you know what, I'm going to get paid for getting punched in the face? <laughs> I prefer to punch people in the face. Hold yeah. back, give it. Yeah. Yeah. I, saw, I see boxing like Christmas. Yeah. So I'm about to give him presents. Yeah. <laughs> I give bunches of fibres out to people all the time. Yeah. And I know I don't want nothing in return. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I won Junior Abel title when I was 16 and people were mentioning it then. And I thought about it and I thought, yeah, I'm gonna, I probably will go pro. I don't know how far I'll get, but I'll win a British title. That was, that was my goal when I turned pro. Mm-hmm. I want to win a British title. Mm-hmm. I'm good enough to win a British title. I don't know about the world scene because England team, the England selective wouldn't pick me mm. for stuff. Even though I've been to national squads and beat some of the guys who were getting picked. Um, can I can I just ask who were the people in your place that were getting picked? Um, I 
can't remember at the time. Shane Neary. Yeah. yeah I beat him. I knocked Shane Neary out as well. So you beat him as well? I knocked him out. Wow. <laughs> right. So he went on to win a version of a world title, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He, 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 boxed, he boxed in Commonwealth, did really yeah. well. So he was an accomplished amateur. I'd have to look at my record. Mm. There's too many. Peter Richardson from Middlesbrough? Was he from Joe Wade? Um, Very na- yes. Yeah, I'm was. a bit name. Because um, he was always the number one. He went to the Commonwealth. He went to the Olympics. Yeah. Uh, but there's, there's a few who... <clears throat> there's a couple of people I went... I went. I remember going down... I went down to one of the squad trainings and we're doing all the stuff what we're doing. So we've got running, jumping, sprinting. And they were all a little bit taller than me because I'm like 5'7". They're all like 5'9", 5'11". Mm. And they, they beat me at sprints. And they beat me on this particular exercise and that particular exercise. But every time I got in the ring, I beat them up. Mm. And then they turned around and said, yeah, you're not big enough. Um, and at the time, they had a thing where Olympics were coming around when they were 18. And I'd been at squad training for just before that. And they turned around and said to me, we don't pick anyone till you're 20 because you're not mature enough to handle it. Yeah, but the Cubans and the Russians and the Americans are winning titles at 17, 18, 19. No, yeah, but that's then the different lifestyle. We're not picking anyone until you're 20. Mm. No matter how good you are, no matter who you're beating, because I remember I was there with Naz. So me and Naz, same age. He's a little bit older than me. Um, but we were both 18 at the same time when the Olympics came around. And they turned around and gave it, you're not, you two are not getting picked because you're not old enough. Never mind the fact that everybody you've picked, Naz has beat. Yeah, everybody in your squad right now, Naz has beat him. None of them are going to get, he's not going to get picked because he's not old enough. Mm. And same with me, he says, same with you. You're just not old enough yet. But I'm better than the people you're picking. And I can beat the people. Yeah, he can sprint better than me. He can swim better than me because he can't swim. Mm. <laughs> yeah, he can do, yeah, he can, he can roll on the floor better than I can or whatever exercise you want to. But get him in the ring and I beat him. And they didn't like my style either because I'm flashy. Mm-hmm. I don't stand, I didn't do two forward, two steppers. Mm. They used to like hands up, move forward, move back, move forward. And it's like, yeah, but I take that, I destroy that style in the ring. Mm-hmm. I don't box like that. Mm. Um, you you really, get picked. obviously you and uh, all, the, all the Brendan Ingle fighters really depended on the reactions, hands down, uh, certain only a certain few could have got away with it. So you know when you look at your your the Brenda Lingle conveyor belt, yourself, Naz, Ryan Rhodes, Asian Pickering, Johnny Nelson, Harold Bomber Graham, Kel Brook, Kid Galahad. I dare say it, right? I mean, do you know what? Often people describe you as limbo dancers. Once you've seen one, you've seen that you've seen a lot of yours. But the very you're very hard to beat. And how do you train for someone with hands down, southpaw, orthodox? <laughs> We're completely different. Mm. If you look at Naz, yeah, you look at Bomber Graham, you look at me, mm. and you were you were trying to uh, you were trying to devise a tactic to beat either one of us. None of them would be the same. We're all completely different to Johnny, yeah, because Johnny's the most offensive. Johnny Nelson of, for people who don't yeah, know. Yeah, Johnny Nelson. He's he's the most offensive person out of all of us. Mm. Yeah, he doesn't attack very much. He's he was very good at having a strong defence within within the style of what we do. Kel Brook's nothing like Naz. He's nothing like me. Mm. Yeah. He's front foot, isn't he? Yeah, he's front foot. He's, he's, it's not that, but his style, is, he doesn't switch. So what would you say your style is? I am an attacking counterpuncher, mm. oh. which is a complete contradiction. <laughs> 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 yeah, and that's how I, I'm a complete contradiction in what I do. Yeah, my hands are low, but sometimes my hands are up. Mm. Yeah, most of the time my hands aren't that low, but I will drop them. I did it when I boxed Zab Judah. I sat on the ropes, well, it pushed, got me back to the ropes, and the first thing I did is drop my hands. And he threw three shots, slip, 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 parried round, moved around him, and moved off. But at that time, I wasn't aggressive enough yeah. to punish him for the mistakes he was making. Um, that fight taught me what I needed to do. Mm-hmm. And then I went forward and knocked the next 15 people out. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> for me, people who don't know, Zab Judah was really a future Hall of Famer. Fought Floyd Mayweather, fought Amir Khan. Uh, basically won several titles. But Junior took that fight. He hadn't even fought for a British title, and you took it on nine days' notice. Wow. Nine days' notice against the, against the number one in the world. Pound for pound, best in the world. So, how do you train in nine days? You don't. 
<laughs> you know, just get your weight right. It's all, and then nine days. All I did was get me weight, so I'd make the weight, make the weigh in. There's no point of tactics. Yeah, we talk tactics, but realistically, I'm not planning. You can't prepare in nine days to box an elite fighter if you're not. Mm-hmm. Which I was is I was in good shape. I was ready. I was I wasn't. I was probably about nine ten pound off my weight. So I dropped that weight, and that's what I concentrated on doing within them days, making the weight. Once I made the weight, so that's the day before, then I'm thinking about, right, this tactic or that tactic. So you've got to lose nine stone in... Nine pound. Uh, nine pound. I was going to say nine stone, sorry. <laughs> Woo! Still, I don't mind. I had my morning coffee, I promise. Um, blonde blonde but, moment. <laughs> yeah, blonde moment. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so you have to lose nine pounds. How do you do that? Is um, it saunas? Dry now, isn't it? It's... Starf- it, it's Eating very little, um, drinking, drinking the right foods at the right time. It's eating and drinking, and basically no carbs. It's to an extent, it's very much no carbs um, and very little food. Um, it's not pleasant. It wasn't nice. I struggled through it, but I did it. And then once I'd done that, I rehydrated properly. And the thing with people, people get wrong about boxing is not the fact of the weight you lose, it's weight, the way you lose it mm-hmm. and do you hydrate properly after you've done that? And that's what people get wrong. Because after you've, after you've weighed in, you've got basically 24 hours for a title fight. Uh, I think it works out to 36 drink. hours really, doesn't d- d- it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you've got a minimum a day. Yeah. Within that, you've got to drink plenty and you've got to drink it the right amount and the right food before you have food, after you've had food. And it's understanding that science which fighters have got wrong. And if you look at people like Paul Ingle, the way he got it wrong. um, So the fighters who've been badly injured in general, not all of them, it's mainly because they've got the rehydration part wrong of the diet. So the diet before, the dropping weight, they've done that slightly wrong, but the rehydration part, they've got that wrong. I had a fighter, well, I had a fighter, Ingle's had a fighter, um... And he dropped his weight right, and he did everything right, weighed in, and then the part between weighing in and getting in the ring, he just went, he was told exactly what to do, how much to drink, when to drink, what to eat, how long, and he just went, yeah, I'm not bothered with that. You know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep through this. I'm not going to, instead of getting up and having his breakfast, he slept, and he got up at midday, mm. and then his breakfast, then for his lunch, he ate half the food he was supposed to eat, and he had a bit to drink. And he did everything wrong in the 24 hours between weighing in, well, 24, 36, whatever it is, between getting in the ring. And when he got in the ring, for two, two and a half rounds, he actually smashed his kid. And then he just went, boom. Collapsed. Then, 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 then that energy level just dropped completely. And he stayed in the fight, he stayed in the ring, and then in, I think in the, in the 10th round of a 10-rounder, last half minute, last minute he got knocked out. Now, the fight had gone the distance... He'd have lost the fighting points because he didn't have the energy to fight. Mm. But if he rehydrated himself properly and done that bit right, he'd have had the energy throughout the whole fight. And how common is that? Uh, too common. Mm. Was that it, trial and error for you in the beginning? Did you ever miscalculate when you were learning? The- oh, I've miscalculated a few times, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Um, one of my fights, I boxed a kid from Dewsbury called Steve Conway. Mm-hmm. Um, we boxed over in Ireland. We took that fight at on the Wednesday, boxed on the Saturday. So I had a lot of short notice fights. Mm. So boxed on, did made the weight, weighed in because I had to check weight straight away on the Wednesday. We had to weigh in for the fight and weighed in, and I I normally eat probably four or five hours before a fight, and I got to the venue where we're having some food because we were going to we were just. Uh, one at pubs, went for something to eat there, and they didn't have exactly what I wanted, which was the first problem. Then I got there, ordered the food, the food took an hour. Oh. <laughs> Hate it when that happens. Yes. Yeah. Someone so sabotaging you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so then I ate, and then I ate too much of the wrong stuff, because I, I was overconfident. I was overconfident. So I ate the wrong foods, I ate too much of it, I finished, I led, I went back to the hotel room, sat down, and I just went, uh, I don't want to move. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, don't want to move. Yeah, 
Yeah, you boxed in two hours. Hurry up. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So gets ready, gets to the venue, gets warm up. The warm up doesn't go well. Um, but I'm boxing, I'm performing, I'm topping the bill. I mean, we're in Belfast, and I think it was Belfast. It might have been. Anyway, uh, it was Belfast, definitely Ireland. Box, and I get out, and because everything's gone wrong, my timing's gone, my distance has gone, everything's off. Power's still there, um, but I don't perform at the level. I get caught with more shots than I should have get. I got caught with, but then all together just came together just for that bit. Got a few shots together, um, hurt him. I think he injured. I think he injured his shoulder at the same time, mm. and the fight got stopped. So I was going to stop him anyway, but I wanted him to come out to actually take a proper a proper shot. And I thought, right, I've finally got everything together now. I've half clipped him a couple of times. I know I've hurt him. I'm going to stop him. Didn't Can you remember it? who you were fighting? Uh, Stephen Conway. Yeah, Stephen Conway. So, Junior, <clears throat> before, before you went over to the, the pro ranks, well, obviously you by now, you're in the papers, reputation, bit of a fighter. Bradford is known as a tough city. Did you have any kind of gangsters and bad boys trying to latch onto you to, to do their dirty work? No. Um, I was lucky. Mm. Um, because Bradford is a tough, tough place, uh, it's, it? It's, it's got its rough spots. Mm. It's got its rough spots, and especially at that time. But my mum and dad run the, run the nightclub, mm. and we play a lot of reggae music. It's known as Black Black Club. But the clientele in my dad's club was extremely mixed. We had white people, we had black people, Chinese people, Polish people. Um, it was very diverse. And the older, the older communities got on with mum and dad. So whenever I stepped slightly out, yeah, you're allowed on this street, you're not allowed on that street, I'd turn on that street, there's kids still. You go, yeah, I'm going to go down here. Someone would see me. And someone I wouldn't know. Now I'd come home, I'd be fine, yeah, yeah. Next day, you're on so-and-so street. What? How do you know that? Because someone's seen you. So every time I went slightly out of bounds, because my parents in. were well known and I looked like my dad a lot, people just could see my dad in me. They'd tell my dad to see me. And it was like, every time I stepped anywhere I wasn't supposed to go, I got caught. Mm. And it just helped rein me in. Mm. So it wasn't worth doing anything. Um, it was just one of those. I was, Am I right so in saying happen. Bradford's quite got a bad drug problem? Or did have years ago? It's been up and down with drugs. Um, when I was younger, apparently there were a load of coke about, which I knew nothing about. So you were never tempted to... But, but when ease and pill... Because they were everywhere. Yeah, Everyone was doing... I know friends who did magic mushrooms and mm. ease and tablets and the rest of it. And it's like, I'm not doing it because I'm boxing. Mm. And it kept me away from it. And it really did. And I had friends and it's like, I owe you a fiver. I'll give you this, it's worth a tenner. Not interested. This is what I'm curious about you because it's such a unique story. What do you credit giving you that discipline and focus at such a young age? Was it your parents? Um, parents, boxing, boxing were brilliant. Uh, my old trainer, Ali Callan, who were an old school teacher, mm-hmm. and he always said one of these things was if you say you're going to do it, do it. Even if it puts you out, you said you're going to go do it, go do it. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and it like it kind of like it stuck with me. Um, I, mum and dad were brilliant in respect of just being being right by what you said. Um, what happened with them? So, cause my mum, cause my dad, and it was just like I had that that structure. Being involved with boxing was just brilliant. Because then, because when I got him over to boxing, I turn up on a Wednesday night and be like, "Yeah, we've got a fight for you tomorrow night," and they'd be like, "Turn up at six o'clock. We're going." I turn up. We went to Hull, or we got, we got Rotherham, or we got Sheffield. I wouldn't know, and I wouldn't care. Like six o'clock, I'd be here. We're setting off. We're going to, going to a fight. Bam, that were it. And I just wanted to keep that going. It was like, if I get involved with the drugs and smoking and doing anything like that, it's going to take it away from my ability to fight. What about just going out nightclubs like lads do? You know, pick, you know, hitting on girls and stuff like that. Wasn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Of course you did that. <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask, being that your parents owned a nightclub, did they get any trouble during that era? Um, 
yeah, mum and dad did. Um, I I was very sheltered within that respect. Everything was kept away from me. And I think that was because of the box. That was because of the boxing. Because my brothers knew more. They were, oh yeah, they were four or five years older than me. Um, but they could see more. Whereas I, naive, very naive, and I was kept naive to a lot of stuff that was happening. Um, but yeah, I've helped Martin Club when I got into my teens and stuff and I'd done some bar work. And I don't mind, I didn't, that were all right. Um, but going out, socialising, chasing girls. Yeah, I did plenty of it. Yeah. Did you have a regular girlfriend or did you? Just... Um, I did after after a while. Yeah. So, how how did the young Junior Witter cope with when you're 17, you're 18, you're 19, and all your mates are saying, "Right, we're going Let's to go out of pace. yeah, we're going to club M, we're going to all these nightclubs, have this." Were you ever tempted, or did you just think, "No, I'm going to be a world champion, I'm going to be a British champion"? I didn't actually think. Um, I was. I didn't particularly. I just thought, "No, I'm going to. I'm boxing." And if I start taking drugs, I won't be able to box. And it just stopped me in my tracks. What were you like with alcohol? Um, I wasn't bothered. I'd, I'd drink. I'm not saying I didn't drink because I went out and tried to drink. Um, especially like Saturday nights, Friday nights, Saturday nights. But I wasn't... It wasn't be all and end all. I would have a drink and I like to drink, but I wouldn't. it wasn't be all and end all. And when I, when I turned pro... That's when things change because I just at that point I went. If I'm going to be a professional athlete, I can't go out and get pissed all the time. So that's when it just went boom, not drinking, and it just started cutting down, cutting down, cutting down. So that was so the, next, the, sorry, the, the, the next, next question was: So you're going to go pro? You think right? I'm going to get paid. How did that famous, well famous, Inglebank gym come into your life? You've seen all the stars, you know Nassim Ahmed. Ryan Rhodes, you know, all over Sky Sports for many, many years. How did you end up there? Um, it was always somewhere that was appealing to me. I remember Ryan. First time I saw Ryan, I think Ryan Ryan Rhodes. Ryan Rhodes he was probably oh god, I say I was fifteen, so about eleven, twelve, and he was a little short kid, massive shoulders on him, big puncher, yeah. And he boxed this kid from my gym, who was tall, like a beanpole. No muscle on him whatsoever, but really long arms, really hot. And Ryan was trying to switch and you know, just do the Ingle style. And he was useless. Mm. He was just useless, it, yeah. It just, it just, I just looked at him and I just thought, he's rubbish. This kid, because I knew Naz. We all knew Naz coming through, the same as me. Um, I'd seen Naz a couple of times. He'd been on like news and calendar and up north. So when you when you now, but I looked at Ryan and I just thought he's never going to get that. Mm. He's just, pff, pathetic, mm. yeah. He, he knocked this kid out for my gym, by the way, yeah, because he's a big puncher. But he's, when he did catch him, I went, he's a massive, he's a fighter. Mm. He's not, a, he's not a, yeah. he's not a boxer. He's a fighter. Forward, four or five years later, no, actually, forward, it's probably seven years later. Ryan's eighteen. I'm. 24, 22. Fight comes up, me and Ryan Rhodes. Ryan's is now Ryan's now a middleweight. He's coming down. I'm a welterweight, so I've I'm like, yeah, just push up a little bit. It'd be about 10 10. Yeah. I went, he's never gonna make 10 stone 10. Officially he did. <laughs> um got in, I boxed him. And the first thing he did, he done with me with a shot, hit me with a shot, and I just went. I feel like that big because that's what if proper done with me three times in a row mm -hmm. would you say that was your most challenging fight no no definitely not but it was challenging so I had that and by end of the round I got myself together second round went out got on top of him third round went out and smashed him at pieces so first round he smashed me second round I just won in my eyes and by a lot of people's eyes third round I smashed him fight result he got the he got the nod. He got the win. Um, I was furious. My trainer were furious. I said, right, we're going to have a rematch. Right, we're going to. And Brennan went, yeah, okay, we'll do the rematch. Uh, we've got a show in three week. Next week, you turn pro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was like, ah, <laughs> yeah. But I got to give him credit because, like, a couple of years, two years later, I think, 
Actually, I might have been 20 at the time. Because something like that. But two years later, I turn pro and I walk into the Ingle gym. And I go, see, Ryan. And I went, right, okay. We're having body sparring, let's go. And we get in, I thought, I know what I did to you. Yeah. But the reason I went to that gym was what I seen happen with Ryan. And I just thought, if Brendan can do that with that kid and make him on my level, what's he going to do with me? Mm -hmm. And I thought, that drew me there. And plus, Alec Allen, my old trainer, was a very good friend of Brendan's. Mm. God rest their souls. Four um, years today, past Brendan. Yeah. And Alec, 2010. Um, but he went, if you're going to go pro, go with Brendan, because he looks after his fighters. Mm. Um, it's not just about the money but he will make you money, um, go with Brendan. So I walked into the gym, I knew John and John Ingle from Amateurs, I didn't know Dominic, um, I'd seen a couple of fighters, um, walked what, in. What, what year was this, was, was this when Nassim Mahoud was there? Oh, 96, this is right. when Naz was world so, champion. So Naz left in 98? Yeah. So Naz was there, it was, <clears throat> it was the height of his... Rasmus has even people who didn't like boxing. Nana's Nana's knew who Prince Nassim Mohammed was. What was he really like inside training on a daily basis? <laughs> Stories, please. Um, Nas was hard work. Mm -hmm. It was very hard work in the gym. Um, but yeah, I went in and, and I think my, my partner at the time says the first thing you said when you came home was Nas shows Brendan no respect in the gym. Really. That's the first thing you actually said to me. And I just went, he says, that was the first thing you said about the whole training thing. Right, well, and I just went, yeah, he didn't at that stage. Um, he was world champion. He was flying. Everybody was giving Naz everything. Mm -hmm. and Sponsored by Adidas, everything, yeah, wasn't it? Everything was, everything was flourishing in that respect. But I just thought when I walked in, Jimmy didn't give Brendan any respect. How so? Just the way I talked to him, what he said, what was happening. That ain't happening, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And like, you can say, I want to do this, I want to do that. Yeah. Are we doing this, are we doing that? In a respectful way, Naz didn't. And I just, I just found it hard to actually swallow. Um, yeah, it didn't. Naz, because I knew Naz in amateurs, we went to, squad tra we went to mm. England together and squad training. How good was he? Brilliant. He was absolutely unbelievable. Um, the right fighters would always beat, always beat him, but at that weight, the power he generated, the featherweight, he was unbeatable. Um, so you were, let me think, three weights above Naz. Yeah. Did he ever hurt you? No, he never hurt me. He's caught me with loads. Um, and realistically, at that time, he was walking around the same weight as me. Was he? Yeah, he was walking around 10 and a half, 11 stone. Um, comfort and be happy with that. That's where we were happy at. But he got down, he made weight. He always got down to weight. I spied him, I spied him within that, in that time frame, I spied him quite a lot of times. Um, he was, he was special. Mm. That's but he could have been great. That's what Pickering said to me. He said, he said, I've watched him in training and he was mind blowing. Never mind what you've seen on telly. He said, what he did in the gym every day, he said it was an experience to watch. So what prevented him from being great? Ego. It's, it's funny. It's funny. It's ego made him, and ego stopped him getting there. Breaking. Because the ego made his character, but his problem was, he became his persona. Instead of remembering that, that's the persona you have to fight. That's what you do for a fight. So that's you need a switch to knock on that. This is real life. This is my boxing life, and it all just blurred into one. Moral of, moral of the story, stay grounded. Yeah. yeah. How did you stay grounded? Because you accomplished so much from such a young age. Um, I think it was just, it was just good people around me. Um, I've been in long-term relationships. I've just, I've just managed to, yeah, stay grounded. I'm not, I was going to say, you're right, Big Eddie didn't ring. And I went, that's because I'm good. I'm very good. <laughs> yeah. It's not because it's just it's the front. It's because I am that good, and I believe what I'm saying. Um, but at the same time, what I do is not saving someone's life. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I'm not in an operating theatre. I'm not. 
I'm not a fireman running into a building when and when lives matter. Yeah, and I just think I'm not one of the amazing services. I'm not a hero. Yeah, I'm an athlete and I'm an extremely good one. I'm one of the best ever. But that's all I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I end it there. You do your job. I do my job. My job gets more recognition than yours, but I'm brilliant at what I do. But at the same time, it's just a job. Can I squash a myth or fact today? Yeah. Do you have to give up sex before a fight? (laughs) (laughs) Squash it. (laughs) (laughs) Not true. Um, Do people do it? Yes, they do. To make you more have more yeah, testosterone um, and these people do it say it gives you more testosterone, gives you more fight. And I understand that. But we are talking minute per- percentage and it depends on the person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, See I, I know fighters who <clears throat> well, a well champion now. Uh, I won't name him, but he said only four weeks. No, so none of this twelve week camp. He said it's just the last four weeks. Um mm. It all varies. It all varies on who you are how much sex drive you have, mm. and where you're actually at. Mm. Because it's like with me, with some of my, I'm like, I'm away for, I went, see, camps for me back then were a week. I'd go for a week before the fight. No, not a week, two weeks before the fight, I'd go away for a week before. So the third week out, I'd go out, spend a week on camp, come back, be home for two weeks. So that week I'm away, there's no sex. Mm. Come back that week, depends if I'm actually... If I see you, yeah, because sometimes you don't. And then the week at fight, definitely not. Then you perform. And also some of my boxing mates, they used to go out on like a mad bender after the fight because they obviously been so yeah. restricted up until the fight. Yeah. They go on a bit of a wild one. Did you ever? Um, not to that, no. no. But it's like straight after a fight, I've always had that fight. I, I train, I, I fought straight after a fight. All I want to do is have something to eat, get some food. Yeah, watch, watch actually, rewatch what I've just done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and that's all I want to do. I don't. I have been out times and been to after parties and like, yeah, okay. Sometimes it's all right, but in general, like when I won the world title, when I won my world title, we went, we came back to hotel, we watched the fights, we went to a twenty-four hour American diner. Got a burger and chips. <laughs> yeah, I got burger and chips. Even the trainer's face. Ah! In his face. Yeah. And a Coke. Um, and a cake after. Went back. Chilled, chatted with, chatted with my friends, and, and that were it. I, I wasn't interested in going out and having a load of drunk alcohol. Were you self critical rewatching the fight, though? Extremely. <laughs> mm. I'm, I'm, I am my own worst critic in some, some stuff, and I, re- I was really bad. I rewatched one of my fights when I won the European title, the EU title, not the EB, Kotelnik. not not. Um, Kotelnik. No, 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 not the, not that one. Right. It was. Um, oh, your last time. No, there was the EU and the EBU because EBU yeah, was a yeah. proper one. Kotelnik. the one before that, the smaller one. Mm. I can't remember the name of the kid I boxed, but I remember I wanted to go out and destroy this kid. I wanted to go out and absolutely destroy. I wanted to land a one because we're in Manchester, Ricky's Ricky's show, hometown. I want to go out and put performance on. I want to spark this kid with one punch. Mm. And I went out, and he what he did because he sports he sports my trainer after he says he he watched me and he realised that he wasn't going to win in his normal style. Mm. So he changed what he did to give it basically try and jump on me to have a have a chance. And he's normally a boxer. And I thought, perfect, I'm, it's a boxer, I'm going to come out, I'm going to time it right, it's going to be great. I came out, he came out, and was completely opposite to what he normally does. Mm. My tactics here, out the window. Mm. Yeah. Game plan. Yeah, so I had to figure out, and within that time I figured out and got my timing together. Got my timing together, caught him with a shot, and it did him. Yeah, but it wasn't a good, clean knockout. He went back, he made it back to the corner, sat down, and he went, I'm not coming out because he's got my timing now, I'm done. Yeah, and he and that were it. He pulled out, and I'm stood there, and I'm frustrated because I want to land a shot. Yeah, and I and I and I and I wouldn't watch the fight back, and I because I was I really was I was upset with myself, and I thought right now I'm not I'm not even going to watch it. I'm not going to watch it. Then a couple months later, I watched it. I thought yeah, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't terrible. We've got a free podcast today, Jen. You all right to grab the magic mind drink? Two sex. Oh, 
How many's left? The last one. What? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've got 30 podcasts to film over 17 days. I'm having this one, Jen. <gasps> no! <laughs> so how's Magic Mind helping you, Jen? So since it is that lovely time of the month where women um, get a bit grouchy, I found it's helped me with the fatigue, the stress levels, the anxiety, the boost I needed to get me through this week of hell. Great. And why do you take Magic Mind? Because it is natural and it just gives me that boost in the morning. Sets me up for three podcasts in a day. So which ingredient helps you and why? So I read up the ashwagandha reduces stress and anxiety and I found that really helped. Yeah. Fantastic. So I'm going to recommend Magic Mind because so many people I know just ram that coffee down in the mornings. You can get your fix right here but with more natural ingredients. I have a 20% off code to show you guys. It's Sean20. So it's S H A U N 20. To use it, you can go to www.magicminds.co forward slash Sean, S H A U N. And enter the code Sean20. At checkout. The best part is that they have a money back guarantee. If you get the subscription, it's a 40% off. My 40% off code only lasts 10 days. So hurry up. <laughs> yeah, but I never thought anything of it. Then when I rewatched it last year, I looked at it and I thought, "Ooh, that's ten times better than how I had it and managed it in my mind for all them years." It was way the first time you that. watched it in all them years. No, it wasn't the first time I watched it, but the first time I I watched it would just just watch the fighting as a as a pundit, just as someone sat down watching a boxing match. Sit down, watch the boxing match. Did that? That will work. That. And I could see all the shots that actually broke him. And I could see him landing and I could see it happening. But at the time, I didn't want... I wanted that glorious finish. I wanted that big finish, that big KO, one big right hand or a left hook, whatever shot it was, to spark him out. I wanted to spark him out. Didn't happen. So, but it's, it's boxing. <clears throat> Obviously, me and you, were, we're going to be doing the book literally next week now. I met you a couple of years ago, watch your fights. Now, let me tell you and let me tell everyone else... This man is very different getting to know to how how I thought he was on the screen. Do a lot of, <laughs> do a lot of people tell you that, Junior? Oh yeah. Because a lot of people have come up to me and they've said, I can't believe you're doing Junior at his book, he's a knob. And it's like <laughs> one guy one guy said the most the most disliked fighter ever is doing a do it uh, is get his book written by the most hated author ever. <laughs> oh, so, so we're a match made in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Listen, uh, I got a friend. Yeah, um, and he were at, he were at college in Donny doing um, photography. Yeah, and he went. He were doing a piece. So his final piece was he were comparing Ricky Atten and me. Yeah, and he says I want to do a piece on Ricky on both of you, but I've got to. Do, and he went. I've got loads of stuff from Ricky Atten, mm. but I need an I need an in depth picture with one of you for the for the piece. And he went. I can't make it to Chef Manchester. So he's coming to Sheffield because mm. it's ten minutes. That it's ten minutes on tram. And I thought, cheeky sod. Mm. But he's coming, Jim, and we've got talking. And he expects me to be this really yeah. arrogant, horrible person. Mm -hmm. And he came in. And I went, "All right, what are you doing?" He goes, oh, "I'm doing this college place." I went, "All right, cool." We've got talking. Um, and he's like, he couldn't believe how the fact mm. I was just. I'm just me, because I'm just me. And he's like, you're nothing like what I expected. Yeah? Mm. And... I mean, Sean and Jen <clears> probably years. don't appreciate what you're trying to say, because <clears throat> Junior was the guy who turned up after Ricky Hatton's fight, press conferences, saying stuff like, I will destroy you. <laughs> <laughs> I will. That's fight so, so a lot of people yeah. are like, obviously Ricky Hatton's like, everyone's mate he's had a pint with everyone so everyone loved Ricky Hatton so if Ricky Hatton was Luke Skywalker this guy was Darth Vader <laughs> he was a badass do you know what I mean but you yeah. played that part you played the pantomime villain I did but it was the only role that was left for me mm. because I couldn't be the good guy Good, two good guys don't, it doesn't make yeah. They're not. no one's interested and he was number one without a doubt yeah. no matter if you were Joe was he played second fiddle to Ricky Hatton mm -hmm. So you yeah. had to fall into the baddie role. I, there was no other role for me. And that was the 
that was where I was pushed by Frank. Mm. And then Frank, made, he made that he work against for, for Ricky and against me. Um, but it's understanding everything while it's happening. I'm very naive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still very naive. I'm still learning. Um, and I didn't realise how much detriment it was doing to my personality, my, my persona. Mm -hmm. um, we were selling him tickets, but it wasn't doing you any good. Yeah. Mm. So what, what was the role of managers and agents and all that then? No agent. Um, my managers, your manager's role basically is to work with your promoter as in to get the best fights. Um, he's your friend. So your manager's your friend. Your agent, he... If, but I didn't have an agent. But an agent is the person who's going to really take on your... Because there was no social media either. Mm. There was no Facebook. There was no Twitter. All there was was the Sunday papers, mm -hmm. yeah, which right Frank Warren wrote the camp, wrote the articles for. So who was he bigging up? Mm -hmm. Who's he not bigging up? Me. I remember I boxed my tenth fight. I no my ninth fight. I bought ninth tenth. I boxed a kid called Jan Bergman. Now Jan, I boxed. I took this fight at two days' notice. <laughs> Again, three. It might have been three. It was three or four. It was three or four. Um, Jan Bergman was six rounder. Jan Bergman was the IBF number three in the world. He had thirty five fights. He won thirty four. He'd only lost to Costa Zoo, who was the official number two pound for pound fighter in a close fight. No, he lost. He was number and, one in your division, though. Yeah, yeah, he was number one, and he'd had. 28 knockouts so his opponent pulled out failed his medical um i think he failed the night test so he had to get redone so they offered me the fight two days notice there's your money which is my most money i've ever had and mm. uh, he says right you're gonna get that six rounder not bother with six round i've done eight rounder before mm. two days notice. yeah you're boxing i if officially when i asked john i went what's his record he went he's won a few He's knocked a few of them out. Those were his words to me. <laughs> yeah, he's had a few. He's knocked. A, he's knocked most of them out. Yeah, you'll be all right. Wow. You say your manager's your friend. Is he really your friend? <laughs> Come on. Um, John wasn't actually. John was a very. Um, your job. Your manager's job is to be your friend. Mm. But what he did. But what he did was he said. You can box. You'll beat him. But for you. If you know too much knowledge, it might put you off your game plan. So sometimes they do hold back on all the information. Too many choices. Mm. Yeah. Too many cooks for the broth. So within that, there is an element of, yeah, okay. Um, but I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd figured out, I'd heard his record, I knew his record, but I wasn't bothered. Where most fighters would have been, nah, I'm not having it. Mm. Forget that. No chance. Are you mad? Hmm. Yeah, this guy's number three in the world. He's only lost to Costa Zoo. He's knocked 28 out. Yeah, what am I doing? I've had eight fights. I've officially got two draws. Hmm. Yeah, and I've won six. Hmm. <laughs> what was the result of that? I beat him on points. Right. Hmm. I picked him at pieces. So, <clears throat> going back to the question before. So, when was the first time you heard the name? And it wasn't Ricky Hatton then, it was Richard Hatton. So, wh when was the first time? Remember, Richard Hatton. Take me through it all. Um... See, I'm. He boxed. A S man. Sales West, wasn't it? Um, yeah. No, listen. I'm thinking. I'm amateurs, and he boxed a friend of mine. So I'm thinking. Oh, I'd have been. Sid was probably about sixteen, sixteen, seventeen. Mm. So I'm about twenty-one at the time, and he boxed a friend. He boxed a friend of mine, um, and he stopped me, friend. Yeah. But he had a real good fight, and I, I rated him, mate. Um, he was a good amateur, a good fighter, a good pro, to be honest. But he stopped, Ricky stopped him. Mm. Yeah, and I went, oh, mm. you must be good. Mm. A couple of years, at that time, he was a little bit lighter than me, a couple, couple from, what, four years younger than me. Mm. So, yeah, so I was probably about 21 when I first heard his name. But then the band, the bandwagon in the amateurs was rolling with him. Yeah. He was um, getting kids crying, wasn't he? He was, like he, he, he was a big puncher. Breaking like. ribs. He was a big puncher. He, he was a body puncher. And in the amateurs, there isn't many body punchers. Yeah. It's mainly head on. It's three rounds. It's a sprint. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people go for the head. It's very common. 
body punches are very uncommon. Mm -hmm. But Ricky did that, um, which made him his style what, what worked for him. Mm -hmm. um, he had a really good shot to body. So yeah, about twenty one I heard, and then decided on the England squad, and it's like yeah, he's going to box for England, blah blah blah. And I just thought okay, and. Yeah, I heard his name then, but I wasn't phased, bothered. I thought, well, you can, that's not me. So you can do that to anybody else. You're not doing that to me. Same as when I boxed Jan Bergman. Mm. Yeah, I thought, yeah, you've done all that to everybody else. But no one's got my style. I switch more than any other fighter ever has. I could switch every other shot. Which is your most comfortable side? Orthodox. Okay. I'm naturally an orthodox. But I started switching on my own when I'm about 14, 13, 14. Mm. Because where my old trainer used to tra used to teach us is we'd have a training room upstairs. And within the session, we spend half an hour in the training room and we go through the basic shots. Jab, double jab, triple jab. And you go through the whole ABA manual, going through all shots. And did it all one year. Then went back next year and did it all again. Got to the third year and I just went, forget this, right? This is boring. Right, I'm, staying, I'm doing it southpaw. And I just did it southpaw. And then from then, I just got better and better. Until I started taking it into sparring from sparring to fights, and when I were on top, I was good with it, and someone put me under pressure, went back to orthodox. But, yeah. Hmm. So, Ricky Hatton. So, obviously, you know, Ricky Hatton got hmm. famous, his fan base grew. And did you know, hang on a minute, I've got a nemesis, I've got a Ben Eubank, Frotch Groves, this is the guy in my division, and I need to put, put it on him. <laughs> was there something in your head in the early days where I thought, I'm going for this guy? <clears throat> Um, I'll tell you what it was. We went to, I went to a show in Manchester. He was boxing. Mm. Uh, there was him, Farnell and Gomez. Mm -hmm. And Gomez was a ticket seller. Back then, when they first started, it was all about Michael Gomez. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Farnell was second, mm -hmm. and Ricky just was just tagging along with them. Yeah. He was a tag along at that point. Mm. Um, years later, them two fell off, and yeah. he came through. But I remember being through, seeing it in that show, and he boxed. And I was stood with Frank Warren, and he was just Frank Warren was like, "Yeah," and I went, "I went out boxing," because I was just looking to fight, mm -hmm. and I want to get. And he had a bit of publicity behind him, and I knew that in the amateurs, he, well, what did what did he get? Um, world number one, or uh, he went over to. I don't think he got number one, but he was yeah. in Russia and they were calling him Little Tyson. So yeah. he had a spiky blonde hair. Yeah. Uh, well, so he, he, won, he won the ABAs in 97 when he was, so I think he was 18. Yeah. So that he, he literally, I think he had one season, then he, he went pro. I think one of his first fights was on the, the Nas Kevin Kelly yeah. in that, back in yeah. the 97. So yeah. he, won, sure he, he won that fight, but it <clears> was another show. But he boxed, I remember he boxed and I knew they'd had the big drum roll with him and they were pushing him and I just went, I'll box him. I'll beat him. And he'd, Frank just looked at me and went, yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Fight never happened. <laughs> no. And for 10 years it was spoken of. So, yeah. and not that I want to put you on a spot or out, not that we've got a forthcoming biography, <laughs> jazz hands. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> but do you know what? Why, in a very, very subtle, creepy way, sneaking around the houses, why didn't the fight happen? Whose uh, fault was it? Ricky's. 100% Ricky's because he could admit because because you said to me at one point time, he wanted it very small, a little very, point there was a very small bit about a week window okay <laughs> um, but what happened is as you're a massive star in boxing you get to pull the strings as a fighter mm. and if you want to box someone which everybody in the country wants to fight it will happen mm. yeah and that fight had been talked about for years. And he could have done it. He could have made the fight. And he turned around and he just went, nah, don't want it. Um, I know at times Frank didn't want it because it's money, so I understand that. His parents didn't want it because they didn't want him to get beat. And he <laughs> didn't want it because he was scared of getting beat. But it's like now. He's on about, he's done an exhibition. Mm. He's got an exhibition coming up. Marco Antonio Barrera. Marco Antonio Barrera, his mate. Yeah. So one minute, I'm coming back to... to to please all my fans, my millions of fans who've helped me out through years, have made me absolute millions. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to put a show on for them. Yeah, the biggest rivalry that has that's happened in British boxing. Yeah, I can make that fight happen still. Yeah, 
and it will sell. It will make money. Mm. So instead of doing that, I'm going to say I'm coming back. I'm going to I'm going to have a little exhibition with my friend who's been to fights who I've trained with. Yeah, we're going to make millions between us. We're going to give a small percentage to charity, which they will. And I'm I'm glad they're giving some to charity, but it'll be a small percentage, and the rest of it's going to go in our pockets. And it's me, and my mate, who, who I get on with. We've seen, and there's no. Oh, I could make the fight, which the British public would love to see, yeah. and Even it will now. make. Right now, it'll still sell. Yeah, yeah, it'll sell out any venue. Boxing yeah, race. um, it'll be bigger than Can Canbrook. Yeah, because it's all been bigger than Canbrook, and it's still bigger than Canbrook. But I can make that happen. Nah, I'll 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 do that with me because it's safe. It won't make me look stupid. It'll be nice and simple. Mm. And you, I look at Rick and Ricky's. Cause I've been to Ricky's gym. I train with Ricky. I swear. I don't particularly hate the man. Mm. Yeah. But what he's done is horrible and distasteful, mm -hmm. and it's it's wrong. Mm. Um, it's robbed the British public. Yeah, of, of a fight, the biggest fight that never was, all day. Mm. And anyone who can quote me on this, tell me a bigger fight that's never happened than Rich, Ricky Hatton against Junior Witter, and I wait. Is that because he's, he's scared of devaluing his brand if he loses? It's his legacy. So you are willing to come out of retirement and fight Ricky Hatton? I'm, I'm way overweight. I've not been training. Yeah. Uh, the only reason I couldn't do it next week is because I couldn't make weight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But apart from that, so yeah, I need some time to get in shape, as in to make weight. And that's all I do with that fight because I'm not worried about him as a fighter at all. Um, and would I do it? Yeah, of course I'd do it. And he knows I'd do it. There's been a couple of people who pro approached me over the last two years from exhibitions, started getting that bit of pub legs training. Yeah. They, went, they went, What do you do an exhibition? I went, What for? Yeah, and they went, well, if I got someone, I went, who? They went, they've mentioned, I went, I'm not interested. And they went, Ricky, I went, yeah. <laughs> Is he the Straight only one you'd Rick. come back for? Oh, man, with her. Yeah. Oh, man. Mega money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But realistically, yeah. Rick, it's Ricky, Ricky and me, whether I do them. Mm. Of course I would. Can I ask you, how do you think, <clears throat> how do you think Witter v Hatton would have played out? Tell me how the fight would have went. I think would have come out, he'd have come at me. I'd have moved round, I'd have moved round, I'd have picked him off, I'd have picked him off, I'd have picked him off. Um, until... He was caught or something. Um, I think if it was in the very early days... Mm, he suffered from yeah, cuts, didn't he? Yeah, because he suffered from cuts before he had his, his eyebrow shirt. I'd have cut him to ribbons. Mm. Um, if it was after he got his eyes done and he was in his peak, as I would say, mm. I'd have knocked him out in probably four rounds. Mm. I wouldn't have gone past four. Confident. So another, Three or four, man. another fighter you were named. Well, you weren't just named because you were official number one. Was the biggest star on the planet, Floyd Money Mayweather. So how how did you get to number one? Tell us the full story. Um, a lot of time time traffic and beating everybody. Mm. Um, I became number one in, twice in my career. Once for WBO. Who was the champion for then? Zab Judah. Okay. So that was the rematch. I was number one for a year. The fight never got made. Okay. Mm. It never seriously got talked about. It did actually once get talked about seriously. And they pulled some excuses. I'll go into another time. Um, to make that fight get put back on the back shelf. And I went from number one to number three to number 11 mm. in their in WBO rankings. And I just went, it is what it is. You just, life's, life's not fair. Not fair by... And I think that philosophy, understanding life's not fair, you're going to get shit. Yeah, you're going to get stuff which is not fair and you do not deserve. Deal with it and move on. Pick yourself up and get on with it. Yeah, you've been yeah, you've been kicked when you're down. Get up and move on. Because everything else carries on if you don't. Exactly that. So what is your most challenging fight to date? Um Vivian Harris. Um definitely Vivian Harris. And by all accounts my greatest performance. Mm -hmm. Um so that was your first defence, was it second defence? Second defence. So, so I watched see. that. I watched that. Um, it's on my channel, actually, Warcry Publishing. So I watched that in detail the other week. And you were tremendous. But also, can I just say, vicious Vivian Harris. The clues in the name. <laughs> this guy was a monster. He was a monster. <clears throat> Four inch height tall. He was six foot. And five seven. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, he had four inch reach on me. 
Yeah, four years younger. He was on a massive run. Mm. Um, former world champion. He lost to Carlos, uh, Carlos, Carlos Mauser mm. in a bad performance. Yeah. Since then, he picked himself up, got back on, and he was the most feared man. He should have boxed Ricky Hatton for the WBA title. Mm -hmm. Ricky Hatton moved Instead up Instead of Carlos Mauser. Yeah. No, um, but yeah. when he was champion, yeah, he, yeah. Should have, he should have boxed Ricky, but Ricky moved up weight rather than take the fight. Mm -hmm. Um, then came back down. Mm. So I boxed with Vicious Vivian. So everybody was scared of him. He was the man in division that everybody was scared of. And my camp for that fight wasn't great. Just had a few mm. niggles. I'll go into it in my book. <laughs> um, I had some serious injuries. Um, but I just got my head around what I had to do. Um, I'd found out last year it's the one fight... My man and my trainer, Dominic, didn't want. Really? He didn't want the fight. He was trying to get out of the fight. And I'd, I had no idea. Mm. And I just went, I'm not bothered. If he's if he's my challenge and I'm the best in the world, mm. I'm fighting him. I don't care who you are, what you've done, who you've beat. You've not done it to me and you're not going to do it to me. Um, you're my number one. Mm. I'm, if I'm the world champion and I want to be world champion and be proud to be world champion, I will beat whoever's put in front of me. So that's what I went out and did. Um, yeah, but he was he was tall, rangy, massive puncher. Did you have any hairy moments? I know he ate you once or twice, didn't he? Yeah, he hit me with a couple. Um, I remember in the first round, I clipped him with a shot. I hit him with a left hook, and it wobbled him just that bit. And I stepped forward. And this backhand come out like Tommy Hearn's backhand. Came from right hand there, came all the way down. Boom, end it chin. Boom. Step back. Not walking onto another one of them. <laughs> mm. I just went, I'm not walking onto another one of them. Mm. But I learned from mistakes. So I never did. <laughs> yeah. Um I think I dropped him I dropped him in the fourth. And then I finished him off in the seventh. Mm. But it's a great fight and it's a great fight. And everything about the fight is really good. I'll send you this tonight. Cheers. And when you hear the backstory what happened before that fight, it even makes it more impressive. Mm. And I just think to myself, yeah, that's that's the most that's most dangerous fight. That's the fight where is I was. Is that you at your front. absolute peak? I would say that's my peak. That's the best junior weight that's ever been. Um, that that performance that night, especially after what else happened, mm. yeah. Right. I, so Floyd Mayweather, but he just didn't want the fight, did he? No, he didn't. Um, I was, was mandatory he... for nine months. Yeah. Where I beat, I'm, they were final in I won that. And then it was me versus Floyd. He had six months for the fight to happen. After five and a half months, he put an extension in to give him an extra three months, which he's not supposed to do. Yeah. Why? Because it's Floyd Money Mayweather. Mm -hmm. And they went, well, if we lose you, we're, we've lost a massive chunk of money. Because mm -hmm. that time, it it was a soup. Yeah. It wasn't as big as he is now. Yeah. But he was still a massive. He was still a massive superstar. This is this is after he beat Ricky Hatton. Yeah. Uh, but before Oscar De La Hoya, wasn't it? Yeah. I think it's 2006. 2007. 2005, when the fight should have happened, oh, right, realistically. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, that he then vacates, moves up, leaves a vacant title. I get the fight, I get the chance, I box, um, Chop Chop Corley, Demax Corley, former WBO world champion, um, the f odds on favourite. Um, and we, I go in there and I do my job. Mm. And I beat him, it's, and that one isn't a slam dunk, crash bang wallop fight. It's a technical chess match with power. And I clipped him in the fourth round. I think I clipped him in the fourth round in an uppercut. And do you know when you see a punch and it, it doesn't land 100%, mm. but it does enough? Mm -hmm. It half landed, it clipped him, and he just went, boom. I am not risking one of them landing clean. And he won't come out of his shell. Yeah. Um, I picked him off and beat him. And afterwards, after the fight, he th I know he, what he said was, you, you were just too good. You mm. shouldn't be that good. So Floyd Mayweather, did, did you meet him? Have you had many? Um, I've not met him and had a proper conversation with him. Mm. No. Does that leave a bad taste in your mouth, though, that you done everything what was asked of you, you were the mandatory number one, you didn't get there because you were, you know, your fans' favourite and all this, and you got there because you'd beaten everyone? I beat everyone and 
every challenge that we put in front of me. So really, the carpet has been pulled under you, hasn't it? Oh, it definitely was. I look at boxing and I just think the politics of boxing is horrible at times. Because the year after that, Ricky Hatton, hang on, let me think, was it back end of 2000 and, back end of 2006, or maybe it was the back end of 2007, um, Ricky Hatton fights Floyd Mayweather yeah. and, and, and unbelievable the best, money. the best thing with that was, yeah, Ricky always said to me, the reason I never fight you is because you challenged me at ringside and you bad-mouthed me. Yeah, which I said to that which, as well. Which is exactly what he did yeah. to Floyd Mayweather. Yeah. <laughs> Double standards. Yeah. But Floyd took the fight because he knew you were weak. Well, you wouldn't take the fight because you knew I was strong. Because Ricky was coming up a, a division from f- to fight Floyd, wasn't he? Yeah. So, so for all of this, do you feel cheated? <clears throat> um, yeah, well. Mm. But I'm happy because everything I've done in my life, my boxing career, yeah, I've done it right. Boxing's been good to you, hasn't it? Boxing's given me opportunities. I've seen stuff. I've made some good money. I've not made the millions I should have made. Mm. Yeah, I've still made good money. Um, I'm in a good position. I've got my own gym. Um, I've got a uh, fight. We would organize. We change boots. We um, customize boots. Yeah, so I customize boots. I've got things happening in my life. I've got good misses. Mm. So I'm happy with who I am and what I've achieved. I beat everybody in front of me. I've not ducked anyone. I've not run away from any fights. Everything that you're supposed to do as a champion, I've done. Mm. Yeah. I'm not saying I never got beat because, of course, I did. Um, but I'm happy with who I am and what I achieved. And it's given me opportunities to go places, see people. I've boxed in America, Germany, Canada, Denmark. Um, I've travelled the world. I've met some really good people. Yeah. And I've... I've been invited to some good stuff. So another Brit you were linked with and you had the fight and then he accepted the fight mm. and then his teams thought, hang on a minute, he, he's not that old, he can move, he can certainly punch. Let's skip this one, was Amir Khan. What yeah. happened there? Amir Khan, 2011. Mm. Um, so this is really when Amir... In fact, Amir Khan was a world champion. I don't know if it was. I don't know if it was. I yes, can't it was. remember. It, it I've Googled was. it. He'd beat um, another one of your mates who you beat, Katelnik. You beat, yeah, he did. So yeah, so it's around that time. Because mm. I've it's, put a video on my it's... YouTube channel of you calling. Apparently, it looks like it's. You, I think the news have reported it. Ami has accepted it. So why didn't it happen? Sky. It's, it's, it's too sky. much of a risk again. No. Um, well, there's part of that. Um, as far as I understood, because I'm not 100%, what I heard was the fight was agreed, mm. uh, everything was fine. Um, the guy were in charge of Sky Sports at the time. Adam Smith. Um, he said that I did an interview saying I, I wasn't going to make like welterweight again, mm. which I was, which I'd done. I said I wasn't going to make like welterweight again. Then the May Khan fight came up and I said I'm going to do it. Mm. So it was all fine. The money was agreed. Um, venue was already set. It was on Skype. It was a pay per view, and he pulled the plug and he turned around. He said something. The two excuses I heard were: one was that I said I, I wouldn't make that weight again, and two was he didn't want two pay per views in a month. Mm. Uh, let me think. Which company is going to turn? Around and give it? You know what? I don't want to make a couple of million this month. I'm, I'm well, all right. I'm all right. <laughs> yeah. So those were the two excuses I heard. Now, what happened was because of that. Amir Khan left Sky Sports and went with... Um, the other pay-per-view was level. David Hay and Vladimir Klitschko. Didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the other pay-per-view didn't happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he left Sky Sports and he went with... Oh, what are they call now? Uh, uh, Frank Warren's lot. Um, oh, the German team. No, 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 what's the channel called? We can watch pay per I can't, I can't think, but I know you mean. Mm. What's it called? Box Nation. Box Nation. Yeah. Never heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he signed with Box Nation and boxed on the same day against an Irish kid and won. Paul McCluskey. Paul McCluskey. Yeah. And beat Paul McCluskey. Um, a fighter that I almost fought as well, which didn't happen. Yeah. But I look at it and I thought, because he went with Box Nation, Box Nation is with Frank. Frank and me and Frank have had ties for years. He knows who I am. He knows what I do. And I think Frank's team turned around and said to him, no, we don't need that fight. Mm-hmm. 
we'll, we'll bottom Muskuski because Muskuski is an easier fight. It's, a, yeah. it's an easier win. So they took the Muskuski fight and it never got mentioned again. They wouldn't mention my name ever again. So two top elite fighters you met um, <clears throat> and um, one of them beat Manny Pacquiao, so Tim Bradley. So Manny Pacquiao is probably the greatest fighter ever. He's the only fighter ever in the history of boxing that's won titles in eight divisions. So Tim Bradley... Um, was coming through relatively unknown it was a majority decision um, and then you fight who was the other American uh, Slippery God. Southpaw come on Alexander. yeah Devin Alexander Devin Alexander so See, them two fights I told you I'm good with names <laughs> top top elite you can't get any better in your division Tim Bradley um, it was the night after Ricky Hatton beat Juan Lascano and um, Ricky Hatton went very public and he said tell, tell Junior Witter I'll give him a job cleaning the stadium oh yeah. so so that, did. That, I, I read that, that. yeah Shit. I remember oh, hearing it so God. you're going into Tim Bradley fight it's the only fight I think you didn't you should have pulled out we would probably go more in the book oh, definitely should have pulled out uh, he was definitely I mean listen he was an unheard name at the time but for what he actually went on to do, he's an, he's unbelievable, really, that year you got so close because he was a very, very he skilled was a, fighter. He's, he's very accomplished, very skilled. Um, head like dangerous. a bowling ball. Yeah, head like a bowling ball. Nutted about seven people yeah. in a row and yeah. cut them. Seven fights yeah, in a row. Is. Very dangerous fighter. Um, but yeah, I definitely shouldn't have been in a fight. My mind was elsewhere. It's the only fight I've walked at ring and thought, I just want to go home. Yeah, I don't. I didn't want to be in the ring. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to go in the ring. Uh, I was contracted to do it. You got to do what you say you're gonna do. Um, I felt like my back, my hand was twisted up my back. I went into the ring, and I just thought I've already peaked. I know I've peaked. Peaked about two weeks ago. I've got very little left in tank. I'm gonna go in. I'm just gonna box him, win him on skill foot because I'm technically way better than him. He didn't impress me. In, there was nothing about what he did that made me think this is a dangerous fight. Yeah. Yeah, he's a decent puncher. But technically, them punches are not going to land on me. So no matter how big a puncher you are, if you do not land, it doesn't matter. So I looked at him, I looked at his technique, I looked at his style, and I went, Yeah, he's he's good when he stand there and do that. He's very dangerous. Mm. Um I got in with him, went through motions. Got clipped, went down, got back up. And he's like, oh, a big punch. And I just went, there's nothing in it. It doesn't even hurt. Majority decision. Split decision. Um, Channel 5. So the fight was Channel 5 live yeah. back in 2000. I just think, if I'd have been in Scotland, I'd have won eight rounds. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, Devin Alexander as well. That was another. Do you know what? We'll leave that for the book. But do you know what? Boxing is a very unforgiving sport. And fighters who I've met hang around a bit too long. And the faculties are gone. Where you now, you're still a good-looking guy. You're gonna do a you're gonna do a forthcoming exclusive biography with this very handsome author who's hated a bit as well. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know. But looking back on your boxing career, Junior, looking back on it all, you know, looking back now, middle-aged, pipe slippers, granddad, <laughs> flat cap, <laughs> you know, proper Yorkshire granddad. <laughs> looking back on your life, do you think, wow? It was all a dream, or are you happy? Yes, you could have had the big pay-per-view fights, but you know what? What what I say is British, Commonwealth, European, and a world champion. So really, you completed the sport of boxing. There's nothing else you could have done. At the time, I'd, I look and I think, yeah, I I did everything that was asked for me. I've achieved it. I've not ducked anyone. I've, I've not run. I'm happy with what I did in boxing. Outside the ring, financially, I should have done a hell of a lot more. Yeah. And that sometimes grates. So every now and then that'll grate on me. But realistically, I'm happy. I'm happy with who I am and what I achieved. I'm happy where I am in my life. Everybody wants more money. Yeah. But I know people who are multi-millionaires and, yeah. and, and they're completely unhappy. Yeah. And I know a guy who officially achieved a lot, yeah. um, got paid a hell of a lot, and is miserable as out. Mm-hmm. But I remember Ricky, because um, he coming to he come into Ingle Gym. Ricky you, Hatton. Ricky Hatton. When I can't remember, can't remember. It was when 
he'd always, he always family fallen out with him because he fell out with his dad because his yeah, dad yeah, nicked, yeah. nicked it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It went public, it was in the books and all this. Yeah, so his dad had nicked some money off him. And he'd come into the gym and he sat there and he went, and his missus had just split up for him coming up to Christmas. And he had someone sparring someone in Ingle Gym. And he come in and he went, and he just looked down and what's up? And he just went, what have I got to be happy about? He says, half my family don't speak to me. I've got no missus. I've got a load of money in the bank. And he was sad character. And I just went, mm. you've done what you've done. You've, you're in that position because you're in that position. But you have actually achieved and you've had loads of... Mm. He's had loads of opportunities. He's met loads of people, met all his idols. He's, he's done everything. Everything's been given to him. Yeah. And he's sat there and he's unhappy. He's, he's like, had oh. Oasis walking up the ring. He's yeah. had he's had Beckham it, sat there, you know. But <clears throat> can I ask you a question? Do you think there'll ever be a time in your life when you'll sit down, even when you're 70 and you're 80, and you'll have a pint of Ricky Hatton, and you'll go, you utter. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll have a cuddle and all this. And, or, I don't know. Listen, listen I think forever... Whether you like this or not, and whether Ricky Hatton likes it or not, yous are going to be forever linked. There's this kind of bond. And uh, do you know what? I'd still love to see the fight now. You know, Ricky's fighting in July. Uh, I, I would personally love to see that fight in November. So, do you know yeah, what? I, listen, there's no doubt about it. I'd do it. Yeah. Mm. Um, you do it for free. Because you once not, went it's, public it's, and you said, I'll fight Ricky Hatton for free. It, I did. It was on telly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but no, it's uh, everyone's paying for what they're doing. But it's more a case of I'd do it because I'm still, I'm upset. still upset. I'm not upset. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with what I did. I'm, com- I am, what is known as. I've still got that little bit more I can give. Mm. Yeah. So if he wants it, it's there. Mm. But I know he's scared of it. Yeah. I've seen him in gym because I've been, I went to his gym about 2011. 2015. Uh, 2000, I think for the first time I was 11, I think I finished 2000, about 15 ish. So I've been to his gym a few times. I sparred all the guys he had. Mm. Yeah, and so I beat you were them paid all. to spar his younger kids? Yeah, and I beat them all up. Mm. Yeah. And he had a kid who was supposed to be boxing Canelo. Um, he was a light middleweight European champion. Mm. And I sparred him a few times. And I just found it easy. Mm. Yeah. And you could see Ricky watching out of the corner of his eye and he's like, it burnt him. Mm. It burnt him. And I just went, it's because you didn't stick up. To, you didn't live up to what who you said you are and that's why you're unhappy with the money you've got. Mm. Because you said you were this, you said you were for people, you said you give them what they want and you know you haven't. Mm. So that's what burns him. So I've got to ask the burning question. Hmm. Favourite boxer of all time? Me. <laughs> right. Uh, for me, the best boxer ever will be Roy Jones Jr. Yeah. Um, there's other couple of things that have happened since, but realistically, he was awkward. He was skillful. He fast, was powerful. Fast, he well, was fast. Him. He moved up through weights. Um, it were things he did when he did them. Mm. Yeah. Muhammad Ali, brilliant fighter, love him, love him a lot, a lot of respect, but he just took it to that next level. And it don't matter that Pacquiao's won eight world titles, Mayweather's won seven, but seven different ways, I should say. And it's like, it don't matter how many, it's what the way he did it was, he went up, beat the best, moved up, beat the best, moved up, moved, jumped weights, moved up to heavyweight and beat a competent heavyweight world champion. He didn't just it didn't go out then like, right, what's this what's the crappiest person I can fight? Right, we can get a version of a world title. Mm. Yeah, because there was a couple of versions then. That yeah. not as many as there is now. But we can do it and say I'm world champ. No. He went out and he boxed a competent world champion. Who beat yeah. Evander Holyfield? Yeah. Who was on form? Mm. And he went out and he, he, he not only beat him, he hurt him. He stopped him in his tracks. He made him fall. Yeah, and I was just give it I've got to give it to him. Um I've met, I've met him a couple of times, and I remember last time I spoke to him, he says, I said, what fight for you would you have if out of all the fights, if that didn't happen? What's the fight you wanted that didn't happen? And he went, Tyson. I was going to ask about Tyson. Yeah, and I just thought, ooh. But of course it did happen in an exhibition. Yeah, exhibition is rubbish. Yeah. So, <laughs> four, years, four, years ago, four years ago today, Brendan Ingle, God rest him, sadly passed. 
So you knew him extremely, extremely well. Maybe the greatest, greatest trainer Britain's ever seen. He's yeah. arguably up there. Yeah, so Brendan, he was wacky. He was different. He was unique. He was charismatic. He was definitely. he was a one-off. Tell me some Brendan Ingle stories. Because <laughs> everyone knows Brendan. Sean doesn't. Sean doesn't have a clue. But no. all of you, all of you is, you know, Sean doesn't even know who Scooby-Doo is. Do you know what I mean? I was in America for 20 years. <laughs> so, listen, oh. everyone knows who Brendan Ingle is. Uh, who was he? Brendan, Brendan was a trainer, coach, a mentor, a friend. And he was a father figure for so many kids. Brendan's life was boxing. But it wasn't just about the champions. It was about the kids coming through who are never going to win an area title. Yeah. Who are never going to box pro. Yeah. So he put as much time in them he as he put, did? He put time into the kids who were on the, who were coming through. There were a kid who used to come in and he was all in and out of trouble. Yeah. Not a bad fighter, to be honest. No confidence. Yeah. But a little bit of ability. Um, got no, no gear, no nothing. Yeah. Scruffy little get at times. Yeah. And he put as much time in into him as it did into Ethan Pickering. Yeah. And he'd give you the help that you needed. Because he put some time into me, but put more into Ethan Pickering. He put more into him. He put more into him because they needed that in their lives. He was just. I just looked at him and I thought, you've got the time, you've got the money. Because he was a multimillionaire. Yeah. At least. Um, but he's, he wasn't bothered about money. He wasn't bothered about... Yeah, he was bothered about success and everybody wants world champions because you've got to pay the bills and stuff. But he put time into people who needed it. You need that much, I'll give you that much. You need that. You needed a little bit. You need a little bit. But he'd give you enough. He'd tell you stories about stuff that happened with Slugger O'Toole, Johnny Nelson, Naz, when they went around the world. And he'd show you an experience. That. And that. Yeah, yeah. It, and I just think... He was such a giving man, yeah. Um, he cared. Mm. He cared. He won. That's what I says about your trainers being your best friend. He, well, your manager being your best friend because he was part of, manager for, for part of my career. Um, he cared about me. Mm. He wasn't as much as he wanted me to succeed and achieve what I wanted. I've seen him say to a fighter who wanted to do some, who had who had some money, and he just went, "It's time to pack up." He went, you're just starting to get hit too often. You're getting caught in sparring. Pack up now. Yeah, I don't want you to box again. Yeah, because you're going to get seriously knocked out. Do you find that people do who don't retire at the right time yes. run a high risk of brain damage? It's a higher risk. Higher risk. It's a higher risk, definitely. Um, it depends on how... But with this kid, what he did was exactly what Brendan told him not to do. Brendan told him to retire. He went... He he left because Brendan said you're not you're not boxing with me again. I'm not being part of your career because it's hard to do that to someone. Mm. It's very hard. And he but what he did was what Brendan's trick was. Whenever he did that with someone, he'd sit him down. And he went, Junior, come and sit inside of me. Mm. Yeah, yeah, um, right. And then, and then, and I'd just be sat there giving it. What am I here for? He went, You're my witness. Mm. And it and it took it to pack up. So he was very clever. He's very astute, wasn't he? Yeah, very, very Some grainy man. Some would rinse him. Yeah. Keep rinsing. I mean, he kind of he kind of done summer, but he was thinking three or four moves ahead, wasn't he? Yeah. And should there be a statue built in him because he'd done so much for the community of Sheffield, didn't he? He did. Sheffield definitely should do some. Winkerbank some, is it the Winkerbank? Listen, they've named the street after him. Have they really? Yeah, the Brendan Ingram Way, the, the street next. So it's in front of his house. Mm. Um, so the street goes down. His house is there, and. Perpendicular. Mm. That's the street. What's named after him, which is at side at gym, because he lives mm. basically. Take a stone. Yeah, you I mean, throw, <clears throat> you throw a stone into. You could throw a stone across the road and hit his house. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, what you, what was unique to your gym? I think it was the only gym in Great Britain that you could have went in and Nassim Ahmed, Bomber Graham, Johnny Nelson, Kel Brook, uh, John Thaxton. You know, there could be like seven champions training all in one. Do you know if what I mean? you went into that unbelievable. Gym, through that period, when I went through that, so from 96 to, to 2005 ish, yeah, you walked in that gym. If you didn't bump into someone who was at least a British champion, yeah. you were very unlucky. You're in the wrong gym. <laughs> you, were, you were extremely unlucky. You walked in when no one's in because the gym must have been empty. Yeah. Because there was Johnny, there was Ryan, there was me, there was Keaton, there was Faith. Ke Keaton. Bust John Buster Keaton. Yeah. 
Ishan Pickering, Kid Galahad. Um, I mean, there's there's a lots of different fight. Richard Towers. Um, what Kid Galahad? Danny yeah. Teasdale. He was a top fighter. Top amateur. Top amateur as a kid when I was um, about. Um, so there well, was there was Kim, lit- Kid Galahad when he came through was when I really noticed him were like 13. Billy Joe Saunders spent a time there. Yeah. Mm. Barry was in trouble a lot. Brendan spent a lot of time with him. Mm. Brought him, kept him away from trouble. Talked him into being a better human being. Yeah. Talked him to seeing, yeah, we know what he does that, and we know he does that, and he's involved in this, and he's involved in that. Don't get involved with it. Come away from that, like, get involved in boxing. Spend your time. I remember Brendan brought, when when Barry first walked in gym, kidding out, um, Brendan made him do lines for four hours, just on footwork. Explain, explain to the viewers what lines Now, footwork is, is, uh, so you're basically going, there's a couple of lines on gym. Painted floor. Yeah. So you move across in set manoeuvres. And it's boring as... Mm. It boring gets. It's as boring as, bo- as boxing gets. Mm. Yeah. And... Brendan used to make him sing a song as well. Oh, we Pink just, and yellow and... We do so, we sing yeah. songs. I still do that. <laughs> mine. Yeah. And they don't like it. And dancing we never did. Dancing and all this. And <laughs> dancing, singing. Irish dancing? Oh, no. Yes. I've done that with Brendan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've done that. Um, but it was just with the lines, you... Just repeat and practice your basics. So your straight jabs, your left shots, your one shot, uh, your left hooks, your right. So you just move up and down the line, practicing certain moves, but it's extremely boring. So you go up and down twice, three times, by like third time you're bored, and then you just, and he kept made him do it for four hours. Mm. Just, Is that almost to test your discipline? discipline? Discipline. Yeah. 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 It's almost uh, a break him as well, isn't it? It's and it was it. It get him into a system. This is what you need to do if you want to be champion. Mm. Yeah. And Barry did it, and Brendan was very happy. Um, and then from then, he spent time with him. He says, if you're willing to give me that, I will put this into you. And he helped Barry out, talked to him, educated him, just general life, right? Well, that person's going to do that, okay. In two years, he's going to be in prison. No, he's not. He's, he's good run this and that to his letters in prison. I remember Brendan saying to me in 99, yeah, Floyd Murder will move up from super featherweight all the way to welterweight and maybe light middle and win world titles in all weights. He said that then? He said he that in that 99. Prediction. So yeah. in 2006, <clears throat> 2007, Brendan went public, because I found this the other night, Brendan, to quote Brendan Ingle, said, Junior Witter would stand Floyd Money Mayweather on his head. So that was Brendan Ingle. That's how much faith and confidence he had in you yeah. that you were going to beat him. Now, whether whether that would have happened, I would don't know. Happened. But <laughs> yeah, but do you know what? The people who give uh, Mayweather the most problems was the people like Zab Judah with your style. So if, I definitely think you would have caused some kittens for half a fi- for half a fight. I'd have done more than that. The thing was, he's on Mayweather's on record as saying he's most hard fight for how many years was a guy called Emmanuel Augustus, Burton yeah. Emmanuel Augustus he changed yeah. his name as well yeah. um, Emmanuel Burton Augustus man. and he's known as the drunken master if you ever google the drunken master of boxing you'll see him yeah he's unbelievable he's, he's, he's like he's drunk so one minute he's boxing <laughs> then he's got his down here then he's up here he passes and out he's, he, he's, <laughs> you've never, almost you've never seen <laughs> then he has a bottle of white lightning and he's got, <laughs> you've never ever seen anything like him <laughs> and, and he's like people are what People struggle to deal yeah. with him. And Floyd's gone as down. He's the hardest person he's ever boxed. Yeah. yeah. And he is what's technic what they technically call what they call these is as a top class journeyman. You couldn't Only the ha- elite beat him. Yeah. Yeah. He was a gatekeeper. Yeah. But for me, he does a lot of the stuff I do. Mm. But he hasn't got the power. He hasn't got the finish. He hasn't got mm. that that little bit of Nasty spike streak. you need. Yeah. yeah. And he doesn't punish people enough. So I look and I just think, well, he does a lot of stuff I do, mm. and I do vice versa. Yeah, not not because we've studied each other, just because that's how we've developed. Yeah, and I went, but I'm more aggressive, I'm I'm more ruthless, and I'll finish him. And I I because we looked at Mayweather fight, obviously costed, and I looked at shots that I would throw against Mayweather in certain circumstances, and I just went, but I'd just do that. Yeah, and I know I'd do it because I do it, not because. 
I've seen people say, yeah, I'm just going to hit this. I'm going to hit you. I hit Johnny with this shot. And then Johnny Nelson just moved out of the way because it's, because it's predictable. The shots I throw aren't as predictable. They are extremely effective. So when it comes to it, I'm very confident I would have beat Floyd. Mm. But I think it was an absolutely brilliant fight. Mm. I've, I've just had a flashback <clears throat> to the end of 2007. So Boxing News interviewing Junior Witter. And they said, Junior, what's your, what's your best punch of 2007? Do you know what he said? He said, the punch that Floyd Mayweather left, check left hooked him and made Ricky Hatton run into the... Co- um, Head post. Head post well, and, and, and knock himself out. And the the backlash and hate you got off that was unbelievable. <laughs> but that, but that's, that's, that's a <laughs> microdot of what kind of things he put out to the public. So, of course, people will go, oh, I can't stand that Junior Witter because everyone was in love with Ricky Hatton. But, you know, said, did you do that what, for a reaction? Um, part of it was, we're talking about Ricky Hatton because Ricky Hatton, I think he retired around then. Yes, he said, did. They said, what's... What's the most memorable thing about Ricky Hatton? I went, when he, when he had put the post after that check up. Because that's what it was. <laughs> it had just happened. I'd just seen it. I'd watched it the day before. Mm-hmm. Boom. And I just went, that's funny, that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's like, but someone said, well, you felt like you went through ropes. And I went, I did. Superman. No one else does it like me. Yeah. I owe my mistakes. Yeah. And I owe what, what happens. Um, and if you want to bring it up, bring it up. Yeah. You it just is. brought that up. I've just totally forgot about that. But So you fought in the prize fight in 2015. Uh, let me think. So it was a final against a guy called Kamachi or something like that. Kamachi. Yeah. So exactly. I think no. you throw a punch, he moves, and he goes right there through the rope and out the ring. So is it God kind of like kind of looking out for a cat and said, <laughs> you humiliated him. <laughs> Have this. Because <laughs> that was a proper... And it looked, it looked like you hurt yourself as well. Um, a little bit. The thing was, <laughs> <laughs> modest. I'll send you tonight. Um, I had the fight because it was like price fight. So the first fight, yeah. I pulled my shoulder. Yeah. And really, I almost dropped out the second fight because of my shoulder. Then that happened in the third fight, and I know what it was. I over, I over exaggerated. I overstepped my fight. I got my weight on just over my front foot a little bit too much, and the canvas slipped at the same time. Mm. Oh. So. It's one of those where your canvas is tight, you falls down, boom. Mm. But if you put, if you're on the mat and you put your weight on your mat and the mat slips, that's what happened, which pushed me forward even more. And then I just ended up going further forward as he sidestepped, a little nudge, and I went through ropes. Took cameraman out, jumped back up, jumped back in the ring in seven seconds. <laughs> Was the cameraman all right? He's, he's not talked to me since. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, now you finish, you retired. Do you want to say to the public, listen, because I spoke to John Spenceley, middle of boxing promoter years ago, and he said, you know, I was he's on the same bill as uh, Muhammad Ali, which was Cassius Clay then. And he said, you know what, Jamie? He said, I was taught to him, and I thought, what a lovely man he was. And then the cameras come. This was when he fought Henry Cooper. Yeah. And he said, as soon as he opened the door, he put like a cape on and turned into a different one. So to all the people out there, who's seen Junior Witter, turned up at press conferences, humiliating Ricky Hatton, doing all the things that people might not like. Was that you, or was it not you, or were you putting a mask on? Listen, within boxing, you've got to have a personality, a persona, and that was what I was given. And it's not a case of I got to choose what I wanted to do. That was the only thing that was left for me to do. So I did that. And do whatever you do to the best of your ability. Mm. So I did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, people don't understand how quiet I am. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, do I get nervous? Because I get nervous with stuff. But you just got to get on with stuff. So, um, yeah, everybody has doubts, this and niggas and that. But I'm, but I'm just a guy. Mm. So, in the ring, under the spotlight, talking boxing, my persona comes out. Mm. Yeah. And I get big because I was that good. Yeah. Yeah. I was that. I had that ability and I did that. But put that one at the ring, that goes on the shelf. Not forgetting, you were a kid from a council estate in Bradford who thought, you know what, I'll give this boxing game a go. I might be a British champion. So then went to the Commonwealth level above, European level above, versions of a lower world title, which is probably levels above. And then the big one. So you probably 
done everything you ever thought you could have achieved. But looking back, are you happy now? Yeah, I'm still happy with who I am. I'm still happy with what I achieved. I would have liked more recognition for what I achieved. Because yeah. that fight, when I boxed Jan Bergman, mm. the world number three, yeah, it ran a Naz bill in Manchester. Naz gets double prejudice. Was it Paul Ingle fight? I don't even know. Yeah, it was. I, I wasn't. Manchester. I do not care. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not bothered about Naz at that point. Naz yeah. does whatever. Naz is doing his thing. <laughs> so Naz has got double double pre- prejudice spread. All of the fights come through, down column, down column. The last little bit, two little lines, like mm. that big, two little lines saying, Junior Witter beat, Junior Witter beat Jan Bergman, six rounds to nil. Mm. That was it. Wow. So imagine that, yeah? I'm boxing the number three in the world, uh, three days notice, two, three days notice, and I get two lines saying I've won. Mm. There's no commentary. Is that the Sheffield Star? Um, no, that boxing news. Mm. And Sheffield Star as well. Um, I don't think they give me much more than that. But you got to look at it as Sky didn't even show the fight. So they recorded it because it was, it was a fight they wanted to hype up because they wanted to showcase this, post, um, this opponent mm. for a future possible opponent for Ricky. Mm. Yeah. Um, or Noddy had a Costa Zoo fight. That was supposed to be his next fight. It was supposed to be Costa, was Costa Zufa at world title rematch. Or Zab Judah. So they were building him up for that. So they were get, they had the press for it. Yeah. Going out at world scene, they said to me, yeah, we recorded it because we were, I remember at ringside recording it, then recording fights. So I did that. And they went, yeah, we sent it over to him. We sent it over to South Africa. And we've not, we've not, we've not transformed, transferred it into format that'll play on British free TV. And we're not going to. Mm. So when you face fits, you get the right proper press. So what, it, what do you think? Oh, go on. Do you want, oh, no, do you want to go first? I'm <laughs> feeling polite What today. do you think about all these superstar YouTubers like Jake Paul, Logan Paul, fighting or calling out famous boxers, Floyd versus, was it Jake Paul? I tell you what, I've got a Sunday team that I play with in Park and I'm going to call out Manchester United. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why should you? <laughs> Why should you be allowed, no matter how many fans you've got, to be allowed to box mm-hmm. a quality opponent? Yeah. Why should you be earning? I understand the, the business side of it. Yeah. But why should you be allowed to earn that much money when you're that poor? And they are that poor. Yeah. Um, Aren't they bragging they've made more than any professional boxer? Oh, that kind of that, that's that's the annoying part of it. It's it's true. Mm. A lot of them have earned more than ninety nine point nine 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 percent of fighters. But he has he has made a fortune because he's been doing it since he was a kid. Jake Paul. Jake Paul. Did, so, he, fight, did he beat Did he beat Floyd? Was it? No, it was no. his brother who had an exhibition. Oh, okay. But he has he has actually made multi millions. So right. so this is this is no joke. Yeah. That guy is seriously rich. Yeah. yeah. But um. Yeah, so, Jen, your question. Isn't one of them fighting Mike Tyson as well? Oh, it's not being confirmed. Isn't it? Not but, confirmed. No, no, no. But Jen, go on. It was just, uh, so in the whole of your boxing career, have you any regrets? Um, There's, a, there's always things you tweak. Mm. Yeah. If you go back in your life, you go through, yeah, I just tweak that. I, just, I wouldn't have done that quite then. I'd done it a week before. I'd done that week. Yeah. If I look at fights, the, um, if I look at, when I lost my world title, that's the biggest change I would have made. Yeah. So that wouldn't have happened the way it happened. Yeah. Because I would have said the pressure that I'm on. And the head of the WBC actually turned around and says, if I'd have known that, yeah, the fight wouldn't have happened. Mm. That's what the head of WBC that said at the time. Joe Solomon, was it? No, no, it was his dad. So now, the time before he passed. You've been, <clears throat> you've been asked by a lot of people to do your book. I'm glad you haven't, because uh, obviously I've I've had it in my head to do it for a year. So, Junior Witter, the avoided, the clues in the name. So, why now though? Why when you're kicking on for fifty and I'm making you look really old here? Aren't I? <laughs> Excuse me, I'm 22. No, but I, th- I think I think it's the right time. I think if you'd have done it earlier, it would have been because you've still got chapters. But now, 
you know, is it complete? Unless, unless, I think it is, unless Ricky Hatton, if you're watching, November. But other than that, the avoided, I'm lo I'm really, really looking forward to it. I'm going to put my head, um, get stuck into it. We're going to spend about 20 hours in the next couple of weeks together. And uh, and then just basically get all the highs, the lows, the laughs, the the badness, yeah. you know. And it's your life. I'd, listen, I'd look at it. Someone said to me, I remember someone saying to me, he says, since after my first loss, after Zab Judah loss, he went, you've had seven years unbeaten or whatever it was. And he went, that is longer than most people's careers. Yeah. Yeah, he says, most people's careers is realistically five years yeah somewhere around about five years he went and realistically i boxed for 20 i turned i was pro for 20 years what yeah. yeah um i turned pro in 97 i packed up myself in 2008 i mean 2018 um because i boxed in 2015 i You're never so retired training. within that within that period through all that career i never didn't train i was always competitive and ready for a fight and trying to stay ready for a fight it got to 2018 and i just went if it gets to my birthday it's been two years since i boxed i've been trying to get a british title fight again border control don't want to give me give, give me the shot um Is that because of your age though oh, politics yes he was, was kissing frank's ass um because i should have boxed bradley skeet was it, it was bradley skeet and the other one was uh, oh god! What's I mean, Peter McDonough never got. A, he was around. No, um, but, <laughs> but around that time, Bradley Skeet, anyway. Yeah, and I wanted that fight, mm. and they just he says, "Yeah, you've." But since your last fight, you've not boxed anyone. Really? But my last fight was a European title. What I got robbed, according to you, because talking to Robert Smith and Robert Smith says, yeah. "You were robbed in that fight." We should, because there should have been a complaint gone in. What didn't go in? He went, yeah, you didn't put this, you didn't do this, this, right? So it's like, okay. Pull, pulling strings on me still. Um, but I deserve a British title fight. Since my last fight was a European, and in your own words, I got robbed, so why can't I box for the British in my next fight? Uh, you need to have another four-rounder first. Hmm. So, so that's like, four-rounder is where everyone starts off in boxing. So imagine climbing Everest. <laughs> Right, imagine the biggest mountain in the world, you've done it, you've achieved everything in your life, and then you think, ah, oh, do you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll do it again. No, 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 you've got to go and climb Eston Hills and Middlesbrough. That's what it would be like. A four out, that's an insult, really. Ten sets back. Oh, it's yeah. back to the beginning. He says you've got to, fight, you've got to fight at least a four-rounder within so long before we'll, we'll let you box with British. And I'm just like, but I, you've got other world champions who come back after two years out, yeah. boxing for a world title. Ricky Hatton, three years out. Yeah, but... I've got to come back and box in a just a general fight against some journeyman, because that's what you're talking about, mm. before you let me box for the British. And I'm as good as I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Proper insult. So, I was still fight, trying to get other fights. Um, and when I got to 2018, I just went, if I've got nothing penciled in by March, I'm done. So it got to my birthday and I went, yeah, that's, that's, that's me done. Um... I was coaching at the time, so I was working in at that time. I was working in Ingle Gym before I set my own gym up. Um, I was running there, I'm into gym, and I was like, "Yeah, I've, I've done. I've achieved. I've British Commonwealth, European, and WBC. All the major steps taken. Won all the belts. So defending them. Yeah, and I'm happy. Mm. I'm happy with what I did. British title twice." So, even though you were happy though, was there like a slight pain to detach after de putting decades in? Yeah, um, but I think because what I did, what a lot of fighters don't do, because some fighters they finish and they stop, and then they think, "What am I going to do with the rest of my life?" <laughs> yeah, and what happens is I was speaking to um, John Murray the other day. And or the month I should say, and what he said, what he said back then was simply says, "I was getting phone calls all day, all the time. Do you want this, John? Do you want that? Do you want me to do this for you? Want to do that for you? Yeah." And John went blind in one eye, so his career was over. Is he really? Yeah, fully he, blind. He's just... not fully blind. It's 
it's partial it's partially blind in one eye and if you see him it looks it looks brilliant his eye yeah because it just comes that his pupil just comes down and it, i like it it's a little but the reality of it no thank you so he can see shapes through it he can see colors but he can't what he said is through one of his eyes he can make out if there's someone there but he's struggled to distinguish between a man and a woman. Mm. Yeah, and that was... Rough. Mm. Yeah, that's rough. So, so just clear was always says, the day that happened and I retired, the phone stopped ringing. Really? Yeah, people stopped asking if I need anything. And he says, he's now in a good place, he's got his own gym, he's, he's doing something with himself, he says, but he says he, he couldn't believe the way it went from that interest to... Mm-hmm. It's funny how people drop here. That's what I said. Yeah. It's an and, extremely unforgiven sport. Um, he's man. He's found. He's, he's found himself. So he says, "I fell out with boxing for a bit." He came back. He's doing his own gym now, so he's he's feeling alright about himself and who he is. Um, and he made good money for what he achieved. But a lot of fighters don't have that ability where it stopped one day and they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Because I kept training, I was always fit. I stayed in the gym. I have a game began training amateurs when I was 15. But I always thought in my head, when I retire, I'm going to coach. Yeah. I went, I'm not bothered about managing. Um, I'm just going to coach fighters. Yeah. And I always intended, I'd probably work in Ingle Gym, help coach fighters coming through. After Brendan, Brendan passed, it, just before Brendan passed, the, the management of running the Ingle Gym it all just went, there were too many cooks in, swallowed the broth, and became too many problems. And I was a scapegoat for people to point the finger at. Yeah. And I just went, well, it's not working. Um, I do, I'm doing personal training elsewhere, some of the stuff I was doing. And I just went, right, well, okay, well, you're happy doing that. I'm going to go elsewhere. And I went and did my own thing. Mm. And I've never looked back. It's, it's, it's good. I'm, I'm happy. Um, I've got, I've got an amateur, Dom Hunt, who's the Central Area Middle Welterweight Champion. Um, I've got a couple of the pros who I think they're going, they're going to come through okay. And I've got two amateurs. I've got a kid at the minute who's fifteen. He's ninety-four kilos, and he's six foot eight. Jesus. Wow. He's going to be brilliant. Wow. He's absolutely going to be brilliant. As long as he keeps progressing the way he's progressing, he's had, he's had one, he's got another one coming up. Not tomorrow, actually. Um, so I think he's got a massive future ahead of him. I've got another kid at 13, Farhan Rashid. He's he's had four, he's won four. R really good. Um, it's, like eight, it's like 40 kilos at the minute. But he's going to be brilliant. He's got potential going out where, and there's others in the gym. I just picked them two out because I got them, and that's that's in my head. Um, where I think these people could come through and be world champions as long as they progress the way they're progressing, staying at it. So I'm thinking, so it's like five years with him, six years with him before they turn pro. Then when they turn pro, is another five year project. So I'm like, I've got, I've got things I'm doing. Mm. I'm happy. I've I've got a plan what I'm doing for the next. So that's another ten years down the ride. Oh, wow. So my my old my mate, um he always turns and says, You're doing it the Brendan Ingle way, the Alec Allen way. You're tech well, you're taking the amateurs, bring the amateurs through, turning them pro, making them into champions, help guide their lives. And I'm like and he says it's the hard way because you look people like Dave Colwell, who've come along, set up a gym, got good contacts. So He's talking to the elite fighters who are actually they've had the they've done they've done all the basics already they've learnt their style and then he's just coming along and giving a little tweak and like taking all the credit for training them and mm -hmm. turning them into champions like well the work the work was really done by that person that mm -hmm. person and that person I'm not saying Dave hadn't helped mm -hmm. but the real work was done by that that group over there you're just a little sprinkling on top mm -hmm. within the whole the process of making a cake you're just sprinkling on top it doesn't make the cake so for me. I like putting the work in. I like seeing people progress. I've got kids who are going to come through and they're never going to do anything. But I'm helping them become better people. Yeah. I'm, make, I'm telling kids, right, go to college, get that degree. Yeah. He's, he's like, I've got exams coming up. Right, don't train for a month. 
go in there, do your study, do your revision, pass your exams. Yeah, get your driving test passed. Um, the one at kids who was with me in Ingle, Jamie's come through. It was with me before lockdown, um, trained for a bit. And then he's an engineer. And he's been, he's been, and he's a good, he, right now he'd be a great fighter. Yeah. But he's had that bit of time out because of lockdown. He's had a bit more time out. Um, he's done his studying in, he's done his apprenticeship. He's just got a really good job in engineering. And I'm so happy for him because mm. oh, wow. that's a success. That's what it's about. So for the viewers, <laughs> <laughs> do you have any messages for all the youngsters? Yes, I said youngsters out there thinking about getting into boxing. Um, it's a brilliant thing to learn. It teaches you discipline, respect, self-control, self-worth. Yeah. For people who are shy, people who haven't got a lot of confidence, um, people who just want to be healthy. Yeah. It's really good. There's a lot of aspects to boxing. People always concentrate on the negative. The positives from boxing are absolutely unbelievable. Yeah? And just use it for what you need for you. Yeah? It's a sport. It's it's a tool. It's a stepping stone. Yeah? It's it's not always... You're not all going to be world champions. You're not all going to be British champions. But if it helps you get to that next level, gives you that discipline to do that study and to pass that degree, to get that job as a teacher, to get that job as an engineer... Yeah, to find the the motivation to drag yourself out of bed in the morning gives you that. It can really help with that sort of discipline, and that's the really good stuff boxing does. Yes, and if you become world champion, you make stupid amounts of money. Exactly. <laughs> so, if people want to reach out to you or inquire about your gym, are you on the socials or website? Um, yep. Yeah, uh, what's it called now? Well, <clears throat> he's got a page called Junior Witter, the Avoided. I'm on it. Juniors on it, um, or your missus on it, I think. It's, yeah. So you can get all the junior on Facebook, The Avoided, because obviously that's the title of the book. Very, very fitting as well. Um, you are on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. My Instagram, I look at it. I am not very active. Yeah. But I do look at it and I do see stuff. Um, the Facebook, if you're around Rotherham and you want to come to the gym, uh, Witters Boxing Club, that's the other one um, between me and the missus and some of my coaches so we all replied to on that um i've got switch it customs um which me and my business partner aaron do that so if you're looking for want some boots jazzing up yeah that's what that's what that's really good for so go go through that on that so all the links will be in the description box below this video as will the links for jamie boyle who has Kindly arranged this interview today. Well, Check I out am this doing his book, book so <laughs> I'm kind of the pimp, and I'm this, 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 this is my red light, and Junior's my I'm getting out of my uh, commodity. Well, well chosen. Oh, should we finish that on a fist pump then? <laughs> yeah, well, well, yeah. Cheers, Junior. Cheers, Junior. Cheers. 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 Gadfly Press is proud to announce the publication of Big Joe Egan, the toughest white man on the planet. And that statement came from none other than Mike Tyson, who wrote the introduction to the book. If you want to check it out, the link is in the description box below the video. It's got almost five stars on Amazon, and it is mind-blowing stories of Joe's rise in boxing. You've got the crime story of what went down at the pub, the war at the pub, Joe's incarceration, and how the toughest white man on the planet could not be held down, how he rebuilt his life. He's gone from strength to strength, and what he's, you know, you can see right now what he's doing all over the world. So links will be in the description box below the video. Thanks for watching. And if you want to see the full podcast, it's on our channel now. In which he talks about Michael Francis, Tyson, and loads of big names that he's worked with. Fascinating stories. Check it out. So the book, Big Joe Egan, Toughest White Man on the Planet, is available in all three formats, audio, ebook, and paperback, worldwide on Amazon, link in the description box.